this is the Charisma Quotient. I'm your host, Kim Seltzer, a dating and makeover expert, where I will help you build confidence, make connections, and find love from the outside in. Whether you're casually dating or have been going out with someone for a bit, setting boundaries is an important part of any relationship. But what does that actually mean, that word boundaries? I mean, people throw that out left and right. I mean, overall, if you have blurred or absent boundaries, it means that you will put up with anything in the name of getting love, attention, validation. And to have healthier relationships, both parties should know each other's wants goals, your fears, limits. I mean, you should feel comfortable honestly communicating your needs so that your partner is not afraid and you're not afraid of each other's responses. And I find that so many people that I've worked with fear creating more conflict or more worry about someone not liking them so that they don't speak their truth or share their needs. And a lot of people talk about setting boundaries in relationships, which of course is important. But what about when you're dating? How do you set boundaries when you first meet someone? I mean, isn't that a little bitchy or being an asshole? I hear people talk about that all the time. So there was this woman I worked with, and she really struggled with this whole notion of setting boundaries when she was dating. She didn't understand how her being too nice and not letting men earn her was preventing men from asking her out on a second date. So here's what she would do. She would constantly thank him for every little thing he would do. He, you know, shower him with excessive compliments. And she actually appeared a little bit needy. And she would drive long distances to meet men and go to restaurants she didn't like only to please them. And she thought in her mind that she was being nice, that she was being accommodating, even when deep down she was resentful, having to drive and eating food that wasn't even in her healthy diet. And these are the little things that were huge of why dating was so hard for her. And she always gave and gave and gave until she was depleted. And then in the end became resentful. And she started thinking that all men were jerks. But in reality, she created that for herself and she didn't see that. So we worked together on helping her create healthy dating boundaries so that men found her more appealing and mentally challenging. And that was hard for her. Just even hearing the words appealing and mentally challenging was foreign. She had to learn that saying no or letting men know what she wanted and not appear needy. It was extremely appealing to men. And in the end, men had to meet her closer to where she lived, let men know what food she loved in a flirty, fun way, and really knowing more about what she wants and not compromise herself to get it. She was not allowed to shapeshift into what she thought men liked. It was about what she truly authentically liked. But you know what? It was hard for her to even know what she liked because she was so used to catering to men's needs. So with that, with me here today is an amazing woman who I'm bringing on to help me talk about specific guidelines for setting healthy boundaries when dating. She has had a long-running love affair with helping struggling couples create real connections. And she has a master's degree in psychology. And growing up in the USA as a young immigrant from the Middle East, she has always been fascinated by the critical role family cultures play in intimate relationships. Welcome, Sylvie. Sylvie Kukasian. I think I said it right. Did I say it right? You said it great. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to talk to you about this. Oh my God. I'm so happy to have you on. I mean, I we, I feel like we instantly connected when we were on Demona Hoffman's podcast, Dates and Mates. We did. It was like yeah. kindred spirits coming together. Absolutely. I know. Totally. Okay. I don't know if you know this, but did you know I did drama therapy too? I didn't know that until I read your I bio. I did it. No. I know, not many people know about it. I love that. That's see, that's why we connect. <laughs> that's one. One more reason. Just keeps adding to the list. I love it. I know. Well, you know, I think you have such an interesting background and story, and I'm so excited for this conversation. But 
Tell me more about like a little bit of your journey getting here. Cause I, I didn't know how you got into this, especially coming over, you know, mm-hmm. and maybe some of the struggles and challenges, but you know, what attracted you to do what you're doing now? To do this work. Yeah. Well, I, you said, you know, you know, in my bio, I moved here from the Middle East, from Syria and Saudi Arabia when I was four years old. So I came from a really different cultural background And I think, you know, I didn't even realize how much that affected me until my uh, current relationship that I am in now. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, having the difference of, you know, Middle Eastern background and coming from a really conservative, um, with a conservative lens and then coming to America, which is, you know, of course, a land of freedom and independence and self-sufficiency, which is the opposite of my Middle Eastern background, which is so much more enmeshed and family oriented and just like everything, you do everything with your family. And so here I am, you know, coming with like these two different maps, I kind of felt schizophrenic for most of my, most (laughs) of my childhood, you know, like, who am I? I have that background in acting. Acting was tremendously mm-hmm. healing for me but it never I kind of got to play different characters I yeah. and helped it helped me like claim different feelings and things that I didn't really have access to but it wasn't enough you know I'm like okay I need to actually talk about what's what's behind these um, on a cognitive level so it's like I had the mm-hmm. emotional stuff in acting and then I was like okay I need to actually put my left brain and right brain together to, to feel like a whole person. Is that making sense? Yes, I totally. Yes, absolutely. Well, and what you said about the cultural differences and I, you know, I, I, I work with, you know, clients as I'm sure you do with different cultural backgrounds. And there are like, there's different, almost like cultural rules yeah. on, you know, like how people conduct even dating and, and relationships and stuff like that. So, I mean, with that background and now that you're, you know, you assimilated to the U S like how did that get you to specialize in working with setting boundaries and stuff like that? Cause I think the boundaries are different over in the middle East, aren't they? Definitely. And each yeah. culture of course comes, like you said, with their own rules, with their own, um, just different ways of relating within a family system. So I'm, I have, I have a master's in uh, marriage and family therapy. The core is studying the system of a family. And so you're looking at the different kinds of roles. And so for Middle Eastern families, I would say, again, I don't want to generalize too much here, but there is yeah. definitely themes that come up. And I think with, um, you know, within our culture, boundaries is a little bit of a, was a tricky thing. Mm-hmm. And it, you know, had I stayed in the Middle East, it would have, it would have worked potentially fine because that's the way that it just was. But when I came here, I think learning that, okay, there's a different way of maybe having a little bit more independence, having a little bit more autonomy. But again, it's like kids are not forced to leave at 18 years old in the Middle East, you know, or even here you see Middle oh. Eastern families, they're home. They can be home until they're 26, 30 years old. And that's normal. And huh. so it's like trying to figure out, okay, where do I I find the boundaries for myself, even though there's, again, it's not, there's no right or wrong in either or culture, but I think that's what makes it so hard is like, you really have to go inward. It can be so challenging when they've spent an entire lifetime having boundaries done in a very different way. Yes. Well, and that's actually a good question that you made me think of. Like, what are the challenges that you see that a lot of people have when setting boundaries just overall? So I work within a framework called attachment styles, which I know you, you've spoken a lot about. And um, I won't go too deep in it because I want to be, you know, this, this in its own, it's, it's its own map. Yeah. And, yeah. No, and if, you know, if you want to piggyback with me, I, w- I would, you know, I would love to, because I think it'll help make more sense of the boundaries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, depending on how are we bonded with our, with our parents or caregivers? We have a particular way of bringing boundaries forward into our adult relationship. So if I grew up in a, in a, with a parent that was, um, you know, not really present for me a lot of the time, maybe sometimes they were, sometimes they were. And so I kind of had that inconsistency, but, and I was always kind of reaching for my parents' love, trying to get their attention. Mm-hmm. I have a more anxious attachment style. And so I might have more soft, or um, spongy boundaries because I have to constantly come out of my own boundary, my own self, in order to stay connected to the people around me. Whereas if I would have had a consistent and um, 
available parent more regularly, then I can stay within my own boundary system and have someone coming to me and allowing me to still feel love regardless of whether I have to say no sometimes. So that I've, I've noticed with, with people that are more anxious, they tend to have much more soft or spongy boundaries, which is people that are more avoidantly attached. You know, those are people that may have been really, really neglected as children. And mm. um, they develop a lot more rigid boundaries. They've gotten to kind of take care of themselves and they had to kind of be like that little ad- little adult as a young child. So they had to turn themselves off. They they had to disconnect in a lot of ways and not receive comfort as adults because that is what they had to get used to. So if you're somebody that, let's say you go on dates, but you don't really feel connected to people, or you're just Mm -hmm. constantly saying, no, 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 you're not really open to what's even in front of you. You might not be flexible with your boundaries. That is where I notice people lean a little bit towards more of the avoidantly attached system. Uh, yeah, I was just going to ask you, well, and this is good because maybe as we walk through these different attachment styles and how the different boundaries get blurred, what that looks like in the dating world, right? Like, because yeah. And then then maybe we can like come up with some ideas of how to overcome. Obviously like hiring you would be the best, but (laughs) beyond that, we could give some tips. So like in an anxious attachment style, like at least what I see, and you can tell me too, what you see, I think that like, especially with the women that I work with, they get really attached to getting attention right away. And then if they don't get that attention, like even if the guy doesn't text them back, like, you know, right away, they're, they're so anxious about it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so it could be in the form of texting. It could be just like, if they didn't get like complimented on the date, you know, like little things that maybe other people wouldn't react to. They like, attached to basically Mm -hmm. is, does that make sense? Is that something that you see too? Absolutely. And that definitely, you know, and again, there's a spectrum with these attachment styles. People ask me that all the time. They're like, I feel like I relate to more than one. I'm like, that's normal. Right. (laughs) You know, you don't have to put yourself in a box, but you know, pay attention to what behaviors might be getting in the way from the kind of connection that you want and really focus on improving those things. So what you described, you know, would be somebody that tends to have some anxious you know, some anxious qualities, but then we're also looking at, okay, is this happening with everybody that I'm going on a date with? Or is this a kind of person? So we can start to create a little bit more space because there's going to be some people that's going to make the most secure person feel really, really anxious just because they're not somebody that is really giving and being present to, um, you know, the person in front of them. So mm-hmm. when this is happening across the board with everyone, okay, then we're like, okay, let's start looking inward. What's actually happening. And really, you know, connecting the dots of our story of really understanding why we are anxiously attached when that is continuously playing out can be so helpful. Cause then it's like, yeah. Oh, okay. This makes sense. Why I do this? Because this was, you know, this is triggering those exact memories of how I grew up where my parent was available one day and then the next day they were depressed or they were, you know, an alcoholic and they were sleeping all day. And so I had to reach for my mom or my dad or whoever was, you know, the main person trying to take care of me. And so when I'm on these dates, and their presence just out of, out of nowhere goes away. This is what my brain is perceiving. It's actually not even about this person, but right. it's my, my brain is just having this fireworks experience. And so talking ourselves down from the ledge when we have that context mm-hmm. can be incredibly helpful. Mm, I love that. And, you know, I think what you're talking about is the trust factor that comes up in so many of these situations, because it's hard to know whether you can trust it. And the more that you have that conversation with yourself Mm -hmm. and almost like I I, I call it, it's like debunking your own myths, you know, looking at what are your ghosts or gremlins from the past and what is the reality that is so helpful. It's like a check and balance almost. Absolutely. And you, you, yeah. you said the perfect thing. I think my therapist said that to me once. She's like, you have to learn to trust that this has actually a history. Like it's not just about the person that yeah. this has 
many layers that actually are within you. And I was like, no, 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 this is the person, you know, the part of yeah. me that's like, yeah, I don't want to take right. responsibility for this at all, right? It's you, not me. <laughs> but right. I'll tell you, after the 300th date that I went on and I was like, why am I not feeling connected on these dates? And I just, no matter how the person was showing up, no matter how loving and present, I was like, no, no, no. And I'm way further in the more avoidantly attached um style so for me my stretch was actually okay am i really being vulnerable here am i really sharing myself in a way that is going to allow the possibility for connection am i taking a real kind of risk or am i just you know putting a mask on of being present and you know showing up but i'm actually not giving anyone a fair chance here so I'm on the extreme other side of, you know, the, the client that you were talking about. No, I was just going to ask you, let's move into the avoidance style because, you know, we were talking about anxious. So just as a recap, what is the avoidant? I mean, you started mentioning it, but just to remind the listeners. You got it. So whereas the anxious person, when they feel <clears throat> somebody pulling away or they're not feeling the connection, their tendency is they have activating strategies within their nervous system. They will do mm-hmm. things to, to try to stay connected, even if it's you know acting out or they start texting a handful of times, even though it's the, the relationship is still very new and they've, maybe they've only gone on three dates, but they're starting to start starting to act from that really needy space and they're not able to create allow room for space and trust mm-hmm. okay that if this is going to happen it's going to happen i don't have to make this connection happen and so on the flip side you have somebody that's more avoidantly attached that as soon as a connection does start to happen they have deactivating strategies so they actually their nervous system starts to shut off and that can be anything from you know minimizing contact or actually cutting off the relationship, not being vulnerable in any kind of way. And it's tricky because on the surface, you know, it might look like, like I said, with me, like I thought I was being vulnerable, you know, I was like sharing things that I thought were deep, but there was still something within me that I was really resistant to feeling. And, you know, all, all of the people that have more of the insecure attachments, it's like, you have to be really willing to face the discomfort and healing that the, the relationship is going to have you fa- force you to face. You can't hide mm-hmm. from it. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Yeah. So that's the tricky part. And you know, people who are dating avoidant, like it can be the flip side too that can also cause so much anxiety then like to your point, how you said, like how you're reacting to the person, you could be somebody who's not anxious or avoidant, but you could be dating somebody who is avoidant. And then you're like scratching your head, like, wait a second, things were going so good and we're getting connected. And it's like the minute we said, I love you, or the minute things got really deep, they left. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the disappearing act or the ghosting, if you will, that can drive you mad. But, you know, I think it's so important to understand like what you're saying, where it's coming from. It's, it's so much fear about the trust of it all. Absolutely. And I think that's where, you know, the, the boundaries come in. A lot of times we think of boundaries as more of a, a, like a no, like this is something I don't want you to do or don't do this, but it's also like an inclusion experience. It's also Mm -hmm. what what kind of boundary do I need to create in this dynamic of us, you know, dating that's going to help me feel safe enough to continue. Again, we're still going to feel the anxiety. We're still going to feel, we have to allow the mystery of life to take on its form. We can't control that, but there are certain things that we can do that work for our specific attachment styles that can be very helpful. You know, for me, for example, I needed to be with somebody that was not going to be anxiously attached. I knew that that would be Mm -hmm. my worst nightmare. You know, like I just, I've done it and it's just a disaster for me. And so it's like, there are some pairings that are, they're not, they're not always going to be the healthiest dynamic. And so having a partner that could notice, okay, I'm pulling away and kind of not take it personally, but also still engage with it. With like, for example, that's what my partner did in the first two years. That was mm-hmm. really, really helpful. Like I get you need some time alone. You know, I, I know something's coming up for you. And it required me to have to also face what was coming up Whereas somebody that's anxious really needs somebody that, okay, maybe needs a daily check-in or needs, um, you know, Mm -hmm. a text when they're starting to date. And it's absolutely okay if you're anxiously attached to ask for that, even I would say after a couple of weeks. I mean, why not? Test the waters and just let them know, hey, you know, 
having just a text contact every day yeah. feels really good for me. It helps me feel safe. It helps me feel relaxed. It helps me really enjoy whatever is happening between us. And then it allows you to take care of yourself and see how the other person responds to that need. Yes. Yeah. And which is such a good test almost, you know, yes. when you, when you do that to see who responds. So I, just to clarify, cause what you just said is the perfect example of a boundary just to mm-hmm. highlight what, what you were just saying is it's, it's almost like giving structure to people and letting people know what it is that makes you feel good and safe. And then, and again, it, it doesn't have to be like you said, in, in a reprimanding way, or like you're coming across like being a teacher, you know, you, you need to text me at least three times. Like just to clarify, that's not what we're talking about no, here. No, 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 no. You'll have people right. running for the hills if you go that approach. Oh my God. Yeah. No, but I want to make sure because sometimes yeah. people take it to the extreme, but, but it's almost as a, like a reinforcement and it, you could do it in a fun flirty way. Say, so you know, I love when you say good morning to me in the text mm. with a smiley face. I love that. You know, like little things like that. So you're letting the guy know or the girl know of what it is you like, but you're doing it in a way that's not, yeah, like a teacher or something or like a parent, (laughs) you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You're owning what your needs are and you're giving the other person really valuable information about you. And, you know, it starts from owning it. Like I, unless we own our needs, the person is just, they have no chance. And we just, like you said, we continue, uh, or you said something about debunking that myth where it's like, we kind of replay that same loop, the same Mm -hmm. kind of scenario over and over again until we're able to bring in something even subtly different that can create a totally different result for both of us. Yes. Yes. And then the person, if they don't respond in a good way, that should be a red flag. Yeah. You know, so that's, yeah, it it works all the way around. Okay. So like the example that you just gave, does that work in your opinion for both the anxious and the avoidant? Like are those, is that a good example, boundary setting for both styles? Mm -hmm. Which example? The one the about one the about talking? yeah yeah yeah. Um, I think it's that one works really well for the anxious person. And again, okay. I, I, w- I want to make a note that I'm somebody that leans further into the avoidant, but I have anxious tendencies. So, so even in the beginning right. of my relationship, I had this exact conversation. My my partner and I wouldn't talk all day, and I could feel my nervous system really uncomfortable by the end of the day. And we had to have a conversation like, look, you know, but really it's important for us to, you know, stay connected, at least check in in the morning, even Mm -hmm. in the afternoon once, like I can't go all day without talking to just, I, 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 it just doesn't work, you know? So even though I have the avoidance stuff, I have a lot of the anxious too. And it's, so it's, again, I just want to keep making that note for people that have that tendency to really want to put themselves in the box. Yeah. But if you, if you do have the avoidance stuff for, so for me, that would look like it's important for somebody to not take my needing for space personally. And it's important for me to express that in a way that doesn't make the person not take it personally, you know, like hey, oh. sometimes I, I need to, I need a day to myself or if I'm really triggered. I just need to, you know, kind of spend some time alone. And if the other, and it's not about you, this is just the way that I am. And so having, like you said, the context conversation and then how that person responds to that is very telling of their own attachment style and whether or not, you know, it's okay if they get a little triggered by stuff, but if they're getting really overwhelmed by some of your needs, again, those are all indicators that this might not necessarily be the ideal kind of match. Yes. Okay. So that's good. So like for the avoidant, because the tendency will be needing space because that yes. that's going to, but in a structured way. So a thing that, yeah, a boundary, like you're saying, is to let the person know when you're needing that space. Hey, you know, I'm, I'm going to be um, just taking a spa day. I need just some downtime just to yeah. let you know that yeah, that's yeah. what I'm doing. And then I look forward to seeing you tonight or something like that. So that would be like more something like an avoidant person would need or the boundary. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. And right. also another boundary is a lot of times when I work with people that are paired with an avoidant and they're really good at being vulnerable and sharing and they want their avoidant partner to do the same. And I'm always like, mm-hmm. ah, <laughs> part of me that's like, if you're trying to get somebody that is more internal, that has had to develop a defense 
to basically imagine an avoidant as somebody that has, has been living in their own kind of bubble in a lot of ways. They haven't mm-hmm. been somebody that has had a parent who's been very engaging or sharing with them. And now all of a sudden you want them to like expose themselves, which can trigger a lot of tremendous oh, shame yeah. for them. So you can absolutely let someone know, Hey, you know, I want you to know that I absolutely want to be vulnerable. I want to share of myself. I have a slower pace and it would really appreciate if you can understand that about me and not take it personal. And I want you to know that I'm still going to be making effort to share, but it just might not look like the way that you do it or the way that somebody else might do it. So it's a, it's a, it's like you're taking care of yourself, but you're not Mm -hmm. ignoring the fact of how that can also impact the other person. You're also speaking to their fears because the person on the other end is going to be like, well, am I just going to have to reveal myself and just watch you hide and, you know, never share anything about you. So it's it's not that they still have to be doing the work. This doesn't get to be a cop out for somebody to just have a boundary and then not have to actually do anything. That's where the difference between boundaries and walls really, really get, have to be clarified. Oh, I love that. That, that was a really good example that you just gave too. And, okay. and what I want to highlight too, because this also gets confusing for a lot of clients I work with. It's like the timing of when to set a boundary too, so that it's going to look and sound different on date one versus date 10. You know, so you might not bring something up like what you're saying in date one, obviously you're just getting to know to someone, right? But what we're talking about is as things progress, you're going to get triggered in different ways, whether you tend to lean on the anxious or the avoidant and ways that you're going to set boundaries for yourself. So I just want to like clarify that because I could hear people saying, well, how do I do that on date one? (laughs) That's a beautiful distinction. I love that. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Wait, and there's a third there's a third attachment style. Yes. So there's the fearful avoidant, which is, has a lot of similar tendencies of the avoidant, meaning they can shut down very easily. Um, the, the main difference between the dismissive avoidant and the fearful avoidant is that um, fearful avoidance, they actually feel a lot of anxiety, similar to the anxious attachment when mm-hmm. they start to partner, get deep with someone. So it might they might be able to... Oh, a lot yeah. of the anxious, a lot of the attachment styles their behaviors can, you can almost override them in the, in the first stage of dating because like you're so high off the chemi- your chemicals and you're, mm-hmm. you're in that kind of in love state. So a lot of this stuff doesn't even come up until you're in that second, maybe more deeper, deeply committed, attached stage. And so with fearful avoidance, they feel high anxiety, whereas the dismissive avoidance can turn off much more easily and almost like disown that they have needs. And then of course, end up minimizing the needs of their partner. So if you're with somebody that minimizes your needs or tries to make you feel bad for having them, Uh that is definitely somebody that leans more towards doing that to themselves and has more of that dismissive type. Oh, that's interesting. Are there other styles or are these the main ones that you work these with? Are the, these are the four. So the four, yeah. the last one that you said, I know we didn't speak too much about the fearful. Fearful avoidance um, grew up with parents that were very intrusive. So they had a connection mm. to their parents, similar to how the anxious did. Like they, the anxious still had access to their parents or their caregivers. They might have had some time that were very loving, but the fearful avoidance were either abused or really had very inappropriate ways of being dealt with by their parents or sometimes, you know, parents that um, use the child for their own comfort and weren't really present for their own needs. So as an adult, these people grow up to be um, very mistrustful in relationship. They have that fear of being used a lot of the time. They can tend to be more codependent. Um, mm-hmm. So they might, like you said at the beginning with your client that ends up being really resentful. A yeah. lot of times when I work with somebody that is more fearful avoidant, which, which is an interesting attachment style. Cause a lot of times I would get messages from people and they would say, you know, I felt like I resonated with both. But when you told me about the fearful avoidant, I was like, that's the one. Cause I have the, I have a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. that is, that is how the attachment style really works. Like they really feel the anxiety, but as soon as they're in a relationship, they want to get out of there. So it's like a deep push pull. Whereas the anxious, they don't want to go anywhere. They want closeness. They don't want to leave. 
Oh, that's a good. Does that make sense? Yeah, I haven't heard it spelled out in the way that you just said. No, that because yeah, I have a lot of clients who have that that push me pull me thing. Yeah, happen, and that totally makes sense. So, I mean, the boundaries for that that style is it is it basically then the same for the anxious or the avoidant or both? (laughs) How does that work? It's a kind of combination because like I said, they will feel the anxiety. So they're going to need reassurance and some kind of stability, but they're also going to have this feeling of wanting a slower pace. They're going to want to feel like, um, you know, really getting that the person that they're with is going to understand. It's almost like you're setting up the person to kind of know what, what might come through you. And it's like setting your own Uh container for the relationship. And it's, it's just always nice to give people that heads up. You know, sometimes I can get a little overwhelmed or I can get a little scared. And I just want you to know that this is, this is part of my, you know, my nervous system. I'm working on it. I'm doing my work. But I really ask that when this happens, you know, you don't take it personally and that, you know, you're willing to kind of, um, you know, to get that this is a big part of what, I'm, what I struggle with. And yeah. again, they have to do their work. They have to really question, okay, Am I really being used? Like you said with your client, I'm the one mm-hmm. that's driving everywhere. Of course, mm-hmm. I'm, I feel used or resentful, but so it's like questioning, why is this happening? Is there anything that I'm doing that's creating this dynamic or is it really this person? Because sometimes it is the other person. Sometimes they do pair up with people that are more narcissistic or people that yeah. want to take advantage of them because that's so familiar to their childhood dynamic with their parents. Totally. I was just going to say that could be another podcast in itself and like who yeah. people get attracted to what's healthy and how to work around it or, or work through it. But, yeah. you know, I think what you're saying, the bottom line is, and it comes down to communication. So yeah. much of this is that like the anxiety will get relieved also as you're dating with setting boundaries by communicating with the person that you're dating and, and clarifying you know, yeah. when you clarify and have that communication, I, you, I see it all the time. The anxiety goes down mm-hmm. quite a bit. So I, I love the examples that you gave because I do think that people get confused on what that looks like with dating. Because again, you know, like people don't want to... They, I hear this all the time, like TMI, like, oh, I don't want to, you know, have too much information about me and my upbringing. It's like, it doesn't have to be that way. It's as simple as I love hearing from you in the morning, you know, like just something yes. really simple that, that yes. creates your needs, but also sets the boundary for the other person. Well, and I love that you're speaking about simplicity because I, I do think that's very important, especially when people often ask me, they're like, how do I set boundaries? I'm like, well, the first thing I would recommend is don't actually use the word boundary. I know. Your, you know, because like that's, <laughs> that's usually right. intimidates most people. And they're usually like, wait, what just happened? Because it can feel like this huge wall that we're just putting up. So it's like, don't, exactly. don't use that word. You recognize that you have an internal boundary that you need to take care of, but really language it in a way that you'd want it to be languaged. Like, like just say something like, I love connecting with you. You know, seeing you once a week feels really good to me. It gives me enough time to take care of myself so I can be really present on our dates. Make the boundary exciting for the other person to include them in the delivery of the boundary. Otherwise, guess what? We're likely not going to have an audience if we're so concerned about only taking care of ourselves. Yes. Yes. And so what we're talking about here is that you're not going to, on a first date, say to the guy, you know, I need to let you know that I have to set a boundary about where I'm going to eat with you today. Like that would be the worst thing. I'm being extreme, but saying something like, you know, I love Italian food. I, that's my favorite food. What about you? You know, and just like telling them, you know, steering them in the direction of what you love and seeing how they respond. And then as you progress on the dates, then you can get more specific and what that means Absolutely. to you. Absolutely. And even just taking in consideration what the, you know, men have different sensitivities and rejection points than women. Like if, if a man is, you know, a couple yeah. steps ahead of you and wanting to sleep with you or kiss you and you're not ready, it's like mm-hmm. him taking that, you know, leap of, risk to initiate something like that and turning somebody down and having that internal boundary, you can, you know, you can have the boundary. Hey, I'm not, I'm not really ready for that yet, but I want you to know I'm so attracted to you. I'm so, you know, I'm so into you. I'm enjoying us. So it's like, we're taking care 
of the feeling of rejection. Because I think a lot of times we like, oh, just set the boundary. You don't have to, people have to take care of themselves. Well, I don't think I'd want to be dating somebody that was setting boundaries in ways that was not sensitive to how I might feel. That doesn't feel good. Yes. Oh, that was a great example because that does come up a lot. You know, like how do you set the boundary when it comes to sex and, yeah. and, and all of that? Well, I love this. We could honestly go on and on and on, but um, do you have any like parting words of wisdom that you want to share and then tell us how to find you? Parting words of wisdom. Um, I think, you know, just talking about this with you, Kim, it's just, it's really the key is yeah. the willingness to get to know ourselves and own our, to own our, I don't know, I don't want to use the word limitations, but to own the, the our sensitivities, you know, to really mm. own the, our vulnerabilities and yeah. to, to really be willing to bring those things forward in a, in a gentle and inviting way. And as that's the risk. I think that's what we're always, you know, afraid to do because if we're showing the truth of who we are, that's how we potentially feel rejected. But that's the only way we can know if somebody has the potential to be compatible for us. I love that. I love that. And, and how empowering that is because that's the flip side of it. When you know that you're able to own your vulnerabilities, it's also empowering in the ways that you know that you can change it too. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah. yay. so where can everyone find you? So I would say the main place is my Instagram page. You can find me there. I post lots of uh, daily Oh my content. God, it's awesome, people. Oh. Her Instagram is great. I had the pleasure of going on. To, we did a live together. We Instagram. did. That was so much fun. So much yeah. fun. That's where the hub of my stuff is. And I also have a boundaries program that I created with my own partner as we discovered our own boundaries mm. in our relationship. So if anyone's interested, I can send you the link for that as well. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. And of course, this has been the Charisma Quotient and I'm your host, Kim Seltzer. And remember, you can build confidence, make connections and find love from the outside. In. And of course, make sure you go to my site, seltzerstyle.com. And if you are looking to know how to set boundaries in your love life, definitely check out Sylvie's Instagram and I'll provide a link and, or you can sign up for a free breakthrough call with me too, which you can book right here by clicking on the link in the show description and stay tuned until next week with more tips on how to feel and look fabulous every day.